And I just finally decided, you know, why not? You know, and why am I sending this message to students that the songs they create aren't as important as the music that's created by others? And in fact, in their lives, I think that the music they create probably will be more important to them. They're going to have more fun with it. It's going to be more meaningful to them. So I decided to elevate it. And we're going to start at recitals. The kids get to showcase what they're creating. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode number 108. And if you're one of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching community members, a very special welcome to you today. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Tim Topham, your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, thank you so much for tuning in today. We've had uh, well over 100 episodes now, of course, of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, so lots to learn. If you'd like to find out about what episodes you might have missed, if you're new here, then you can either have a look on the podcast app on your phone or tablet, or head to timtopham.com slash podcast, where you can find a full archive of all our recordings. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is, of course, the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, beaching, uh, b- beaching, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. Summer's coming, so I'm obviously thinking subconsciously about the beach. Today's show notes and a transcript are now available as usual at timtopham.com slash episode 108. This episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Casio Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano. It's been a pleasure exploring Casio's uh, new entry into the hybrid piano market. Of course, they've combined with C. Beckstein, an acoustic piano company in Germany, uh, very well well renowned, and that together they have created uh, what I think is one of the most approachable uh, and best entry level hybrid grand pianos uh, on the market. And of course, with hybrid pianos, you get the best of both worlds, don't you? You get an instrument that never needs tuning. You can move yourself around the house. You don't have to pay for people to come in and move them. You can, of course, use headphones. Uh, you can connect via USB. And you can do things like split the keyboard layer sounds and play along with symphonic recordings. Um, I've been enjoying the Selviano in my studio uh, recently. Um, And one little thing that I've really enjoyed is the music rest. Now, this sounds a little bit strange. I mean, I've already talked in previous episodes about how much I love the action uh, and how uh, great the sound is, of course. So it almost goes without saying in a hybrid piano, those things are all great. But a little thing like a big music rest like you find on a grand piano, I find makes all the difference to my enjoyment of actually sitting and playing an instrument like this. So this uh, instrument has a great music rest, big size, uh, nice little bit of a lean on it, and uh, I just find it really easy to use. Sometimes digital pianos have very small little ones. Anyway, uh, make sure you check it out. Uh, You can find out more about the range of the grand hybrids on offer. They start at around $5,000. Um, up to about seven and a half. So it's great for for those piano teachers who perhaps can't afford a more expensive piano or a bigger acoustic piano or don't have the space, then definitely check out the Silviano Silviano Grand Hybrid from Casio. You can find out more at soundtechnology.com.au and you'll find on that page a where to buy link where you can search and test out one today. This is our second podcast in oral month. Uh, And before you all groan, you know, I'm so sick of oral already. It's what our kids do, right, when we talk about having oral tests. Then I want you to rethink about how we can reframe this because, you know, oral skills are incredibly important for our students. uh, And that ability to sit down and play things that they hear is one of the things that I believe will keep our students playing for the rest of their lives. So today's guest has heaps of fun, free activities on their website that you can do to develop your students' oral skills in a way that is far from boring. There is also a fantastic freebie for today's episode. My guest today has created a How to Teach Piano Students by Ear simple four-step formula. It's a five-page PDF download with instructions on how to get started with this idea of helping students play by ear. So in the episode today, we're going to learn a whole lot of games that you can use to improve students' oral distinction ability. 
But this worksheet, which we'll talk about in the episode, is about how to get started playing by ear with some really simple instructions and some really simple tunes so that students have maximum fun and maximum success. You can grab today's freebie at timtopham.com slash episode 108. Today's guest is a piano teacher, curriculum developer, and author of the widely popular Piano Magic System. She loves helping piano teachers enhance their teaching skills and optimize their studios so that they can use their time efficiently, maximize their profit, and live a life that they love. How good does that sound? Thousands of teachers from all over the world now use the resources on my guest's blog, which is myfunpianostudio.com. How cool is that? Definitely a, and a domain name to, uh, to suit my kind of teaching style. And she uses that to help them create a piano studio business that they love. Welcome to the show, Kristen Jensen. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tim. Absolute pleasure. Tell us a little bit about your teaching studio today, your kind of numbers that you have, kind of ages that you teach and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I have about 50 and I do all kinds of different classes. I have some little intro to music classes for preschoolers, and then um, group classes for beginners, and then some private lessons. Right. So, yeah, it sounds like a complete kind of mix of, of styles and types and ages, uh, and is, is, which probably puts you in the great position that you're in now to create these resources that suit teachers who are teaching group, teachers who are teaching individual, older, younger, and that's why I've been love having a looking at your games, uh, particularly, and we're going to talk about some games in a moment. Um, why are you so passionate about uh, building your students' oral ability the whole year round rather than just before an assessment or an exam or a, an audition? Yeah, I found that it has a big impact on their ability to play creatively. So, so if a student has a melody in their head that they want to get out onto the piano and create music with it, if they've had ear training, it's so much easier for them to do that. And then also... Um, students, I feel like they, they listen to what they're playing better if they've had ear training and learned how to kind of analyze what they're hearing. And um, so then when I see students creating, they are paying attention to what they're creating and trying to get that sound just right. And it's really cool to see what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's a missing link that I've experienced with students when they've played something and they they will outright tell me if I ask them, so, you know, what could you improve about that? Or, uh, you know, what, what would you give yourself out of 10 for that performance? Or what would you improve? And they go, uh, I don't know. Uh, and I say, Do you, did you listen to what you were playing? And they'll be like, no. Um, <laughs> that, you know, some st sometimes students are so focused on if they're reading something in particular that they almost hey. forget to listen. But you're making me rethink that. And maybe it's actually that there's ways in which we can turn our students' ears on to their listening by doing some of these oral activities. Absolutely, I think so. Yeah, um, and so with regard to the kinds of things that you do with students, we'll get into some of your really fun activities in just a moment, but how do you find the time to integrate this in lessons? If we're only teaching short lessons, you know what the time frames are like, how do you then find that time for this? Yeah, with short lessons, it's really hard. Um, with group lessons, it's really easy to fit in ear training. So usually for a group lesson, you have a longer lesson period, like an hour long, a 40 minute lesson, and you just need you know, three minutes or so to do an ear training activity. And it can be a lot of fun when you play games. Then if you're doing private lessons, what the way that I found that's easiest to do it is to find some way to have a little bit of a, a pairing or, or something. So you maybe can have one student stay five minutes later and one student come five minutes early, and then you have this 10 minute overlap. And if you're just starting out in ear training, they're all going to be beginners in ear training. So it doesn't really matter what level they're at. Um, and that way you can get in some fun games and you can do some ear training. And then um, what I do, though, is I actually do most of my lessons. My private lessons are not really fully private. They're kind of a paired lesson. And so um, if I have two students come at a time and one student is doing uh, their private lesson with me at the piano while the other one is doing Piano Media Lab. And I have some ear training activities that they can do on the iPad independently. So and we do some games together also right. in that time. And the, that style of lesson is becoming seems to be becoming more popular as people are appreciating the the fun that can be had when kids get together in in lessons. Uh, would you call it, is that the kind of twenty 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 lesson format that I've heard of? Um, have, have you heard of that structure? Yeah, I have heard of that. Yeah, I don't know that we're exactly. You know, but um, yeah. yeah, 
probably or, 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 and other people will do it uh, sort of 45 minutes and 15 minute crossovers and things. So 30 minute private, 15 crossover for both. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, and it's, it's a great approach. And there's no doubt that, I mean, when I've been a classroom teacher and when kids are in classes together and they're playing games, that's it's more fun. It will always be. And you've got more opportunity to do these kinds of fun activities, I guess. What about for teachers who aren't so confident about their own oral skills? Yeah, that would be me. So <laughs> I never had any ear training at all. Because um, that's the problem, isn't it? Kid. We teach as yeah. we're taught. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's the same with improvising too. If we're not taught how to improvise, yeah. where do we start? So how did you get your confidence up? Um, so I just started with my students. So I started with the beginner students. And as I was training them, um, I just started learning alongside them. So the beginner ear training activities are so easy that uh, for a teacher, I think you'll build your confidence pretty quick. You know, it's just things like, you know, are these two pitches the same or are they different? Um, Does sound like a major chord or a minor chord? And actually teachers who've been playing for a long time, they'll be surprised at how much they really can pick up on once they just start thinking about it. They'll realize they know a lot more than they think they know. Uh, and, and Nicola has just written a blog post, uh, which will come out the same week as this um, podcast about beginner teacher games too. It'll be great to compare the kinds of things you're doing, the kinds of things she's written about, uh, and just get them all together so that teachers have a great resource. That's what I love about doing this. For so sure. we, you've got lots of great fun activities. Why don't we get started and explore a few of them? Okay. I've got a few of these right here. Now, the only thing I feel bad about is that your listeners aren't going to be able to see these, but um, they can hop over to the website and see them. Okay. They're pretty visual. I'll try and describe um, them if, if, I, if it helps. <laughs> okay, so the first thing here is the interval tunes. So one of the best ways I found to help students um, with recognizing melodic intervals is to associate each interval with a song. But the students have a hard time remembering, so they can recognize, okay, that sounds like this song, but I don't remember what interval matches that song right and so i created these interval tunes and they're just this fun um cartoon i call them and uh it matches up with the interval so like jingle bells is unison so the chorus of jingle bells um jingle same note. bells yes and so we've got this reindeer here that looks like a u so and the, the sheet that uh, Kristen's holding up is is very cool it's uh, it's got uh, and it's a sheet divided into four sections and uh, each section is an interval and for each interval there's like a little cartoon so the first one's a unit it's kind of a reindeer unison yeah, reindeer. yeah. Huh? reindeer i thought it was a unicorn for unison but no. <laughs> it's <laughs> jingle bell so, yeah, yeah jingle yeah. bell okay cool uh-huh. and then we've got um here comes the bride is the fourth interval so we have a number four that looks like a bride and then so on from there number five is one of the students favorite Star Wars has that fifth, da, 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 that right there. They love that. And so this number five looks like Darth Vader. And then we've got Somewhere Over the Rainbow for the octave. For right. So. Do you find kids still know these songs, though? Um. So so Jingle Bells for sure, Star Wars for sure, Here Comes the Bride, yeah. Um. So if they don't know them, we just start singing them. And so we just sing the beginning of them and they catch on. So yeah, because I, I remember always remember at school we were taught my Bonnie lies over the ocean for a major sixth. My Bonnie lies. Uh, and, like, no one knows that song anymore, and it's really pretty a lame song. So um, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's it's great. I mean, and, and the other issue you've got, if you try and find a pop song that uses this, then not all kids it's will. It'll change, right? Yeah, it'll change, yeah. and not all kids will know it anyway. So we're kind of stuck. Yeah. It's it's I, I like it as as a way to go. And I like that you've you've not just gone, well, a fifth is Star Wars, but a fifth actually is Star Wars, and it looks like this, and here's a little Darth Vader symbol on the page. So kids can kind of point to it. That's So you're connecting yeah. their visual with their ears mm-hmm. and everything, right? Yeah. So it really helps them remember. And then you can play little games with it, like you'll give them the sheet, and then you can be like, hey, I'm going to play an interval. I want you to place this token on the interval you, you think it sounds like. And so there's tons of games you can play with these sheets, so it's a lot of fun. Right. Nice. Yeah, I really like that. All right, should we look at another one? Yeah, let's do it. So with melodic dictation, this is one that's really popular with beginner kids, and so it's called cookie decorating because it's geared towards kids. Uh, We've got here um, just a set of notes, and so the third note in each set is missing. And so the kids are going to listen to the first two notes and fill in the missing third note. And it will either, when, when working with beginners, that third note is either going to be the same or up one or down one. So it's pretty easy for them to identify. With with ear training, I found that 
uh, they need to build their confidence. So it's always best to start with really like dead simple, like they're going to get it at first. So then they feel like, okay, I can do this and then gradually get um, more advanced, more complicated. Right. But so, yeah, I just uh, use this. And then there's these cookies here that uh, teachers can print out. And they, every time they answer right, there's little treats that they can place on their their cookie. Just hold it up and a, little a, bit, a little bit higher. Oh, sorry. Can you see okay. that? Yeah, yeah. So it's a sheet with a with a big cookie on the middle of it. And then are they little uh, stickers below or tokens Those are just, they're little things that um, can be cut out. That was back when I had more time. If you don't want to cut things out, you can actually use like real candies, like use M&Ms. Right. And, uh, and there's, 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 there's little there. circles in the cookie. It's like the chopped mm -hmm. chips where the chopped chips would go. And each time yeah. they get one right, they fill that out. And do they get yeah. a cookie at the end or something? That'd be a fun little. I haven't done that, but that would be really cool. <laughs> they would love that. I let them eat the candies if we do it with candy. Yeah. Um, and so. that first sheet, I mean, it's very simple. So you've just got musical staves with two notes yeah. per bar, and the, the teacher would play those two notes and then play a third one. The student has to write it in on the music. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Whether it's the same one note higher or lower. I think one of the things. I've made this mistake before and continue to um, as, as, as I improve my skills is I, I jump too far too soon with kids sometimes. I'll just kind of assume that they can hear 10 different intervals from the start, whereas, you know, you, this is a great reminder to us all that we should start small, start simple. Yeah, definitely. And give them real success early on. So then you can make things a bit harder. I think it's it's a great reminder to us all because I, I find it so easy to just jump too fast too soon with, with kids yeah, in sure. a number of areas like that. Great. Okay, so that's the cookie game. Yes. Okay. Um, Makes me think of cookie. Cookie yeah. monster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one right here is um, – here we have, this one's a cupcake one. And so here we have two different, I don't know, melodic patterns that are very simple. Sorry, I'm not holding it up high enough for you. And they would just listen and then try to identify which one matches what they hear. So they've got two samples right here and they just circle whichever one matches what they hear that the teacher played. Right, okay. And so it's written on a sheet in pairs of cupcakes. So the, the I mean, the activities that you're doing, aren't, you know, they're quite simple really. Uh, yeah. the, the trick you've done to make it fun is obviously you've got a fantastic personality, so I'm sure you could make anything fun for these kids. But the second thing is you've got colour, you've got fun pictures, and it's interactive. So they're, just, they're not just saying it to you, they're writing on a sheet or circling something or filling in a cookie. Would you say yeah. that's the thing that engages and keeps them more motivated? Oh, definitely, yeah. It's a lot more fun than if you just give them a plain black and white sheet and you're just playing something on the piano and they're, and they're trying to copy it down. And then uh, um, the group element, if you can find some way to have them with another kid, that makes it more fun too. They love kind of the competition and, and trying to get it right. And yeah. uh, oh, another thing that I could emphasize with, um, with these games too, is that I like to, after we, after the kids answer, we like to tell them what the correct answer is and then sing it together and move their hand up and down as they're singing. Mm -hmm. And that also helps reinforce it so that some kids, some kids pick up on your training really quick. They're just kind of natural at it. Some kids, they have to work hard at it and singing these, singing what they're seeing and hearing helps them understand it better too, the way the pitches move. Right. And as a teacher singing along all the time with them, I think yeah, it really helps sure. too, particularly for the ones that are a little bit more timid. Do you use la or da or kadai, do, re, mis? How do you approach that when they sing? I do teach uh, the do, re, mis, but then sometimes when we're in a group setting, um, when we're doing these at games, a lot of times I just am saying like la and we're just moving our hands up and down. Right. Um, that way the kids can just, they don't have to stress so much about what each pitch's name is. They can just be focusing on whether it's going up and down. Yeah. But you certainly can do that if, if you'd like to. Yeah. So. I'll actually be uh, interviewing Christopher Sutton next week, and we're going to be talking about sulfur and how that all works and whether we should use it and, and all that. So that'll be a good uh, discussion in episode 109 coming up uh, for those of you who are listening. Uh, nice work. Have you got any others at the moment? Um, I do have some rhythmic dictation ones also. Oh, yeah. And so this is a very simple one. The bees so this go one right buzzing here. is the title. Yes. Yes. Uh, for kids. So basically, we've just got two measures and there is a 
a simple rhythmic pattern on the first measure and the second measure is blank. And so the teacher is just going to play the first measure and they're going to follow along with the beat in their head as you do the first measure and then they fill in the second measure. And again, you want to start very simple. Sometimes the second measure might just be a whole note and then they're going to get that right and you're going to cheer so loud that they got that whole note. And then from there you can go on to, to other things. Yeah, so those are some of the... Oh, sorry, did you want to comment? Yeah, no, so it, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, it, there's two bars for each uh, and this is a rhythmic one or a melodic one? This is a rhythmic one. So rhythmic, this one's yeah. just for beginners who are focusing on rhythmic dictation. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and what about prizes? What, what's your take on rewards? For these games, um, you know, for these games, we usually just have fun playing them. I don't necessarily give prizes away. We just sometimes will sometimes we'll keep track of scores and, and award points to the winning team. But a lot of times the game is just for fun and we just see how they do. And, and yeah. Try to get and do you tend to start your lessons with these or finish them? I like to break them up. So we usually start off on the piano and then take a little break, do some off the bench stuff and do some new training as part of the off the bench. Mm. I think it's great for the, for smaller kids too, particularly to keep moving on and off the bench, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> for sure. I've seen that face before. Um, what age do you find these type of activities with the sheets that you've created with cupcakes and cactuses and whatever else on them? What does it work? <laughs> what, what age have you used them up to? So let's see. These I've used up to probably about age 10. The, the interval tunes I use with everybody because mm -hmm. it, it helps everybody, even teenagers. Um, and then with my teenagers, we tend to do more of the stuff on the iPad and it's not so much of the of these, these printouts and things. Yeah, okay. And what, what about, um, let's talk tech for a second. Have you got any favorite iPad apps that you use, particularly for the older adults and teenagers? So I have a couple that I use. I've mostly been able to find only... Um, like interval identification ones. So if there mm. are more out there, I would love to find out about them. <laughs> but um, the ones that I can tell you about that I've used for interval identification are, there's one called relative pitch and one called right note. And so they basically can just quiz the kids or students, anybody on um, intervals. So they'll play a melodic interval or sometimes a harmonic and right. they get to just quiz them, just answer it. They're getting quite clever, some of these apps. I don't know if you found the ones that you can sing into and it can recognise whether you're singing in tune. Have you come across those? That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, there's there's one cool. called Oral Book, which is has been created for exam testing. So it's it's a little bit dry and a bit clunky, but it shows where the technology's at. And I think uh, down the track more of them will be like that because I think one of the hardest things we have about helping kids with oral is we can do it in classes in class but it's not something that most kids will want to go and do at home or, or do you find that they do True. yeah I I haven't even tried because I just know <laughs> that if I ask parents to do that at home it just wouldn't happen so we just try to find a way to do it in class and make it fun yeah but um, I would love it if there were more apps developed where I could have more to do during class that would be awesome with like the the media lab type stuff but yeah for now that's yeah know, where I've we're got, at that. yeah yeah i've got my um page with ipad apps for piano teachers so I'll, I'll have a look if there's any oral ones that i haven't thought of right now uh, and i'll pop them in the show notes for people that's at timtopham.com slash episode 108 now Kristen, you've actually been very very kind and i mentioned at the intro that you've created a special freebie for us and all our listeners which is called How to Teach Piano Students to Play by Ear, a simple four-step formula. And this is downloadable from that show notes page. Can you talk us through it uh, and what people will get when they download this? Yeah, so this is if you want to have your students then take their training and practice taking a song and, and reproducing it on the piano. And so the four-step formula is we're going to first, we need to choose a familiar song. So the goal here is to have the students have a, a quick win. You want them to have that confidence. I can do this. And so I like to choose like really simple folk songs. Um, so the two songs in this printout are Mary Had a Little Lamb and Frere Jaca. Mm -hmm. And so the student needs to be able to sing it for this to work. So you want to like make sure that they are familiar with the song. Then what you do is you give the student the starting note and the range of notes that are included in this song. And what that does is that just kind of simplifies it because if you were just to say to the student, hey, figure out this song, they've got all these piano keys in front of them and they're just gonna feel totally overwhelmed. 
But if you can say, you only need to choose from these keys and let's see if you can figure this out. And you can even take and like put something on the piano keys to show them like, don't go beyond this point. Ah, yeah. So put like a pencil so that they can uh, have it simplified for them. And you give them that starting note and then you're going to sing that note and sing the next note and then say, do you think this next note sounds higher or lower than the first note? And then just let them try to find it. And so you're gonna help them figure out the first few notes and then make, make a big deal out of every note they get right. And really <laughs> yeah. coach them through it, help build their confidence. And then you can turn them loose and see how far they get. Now, if this is during a lesson, you don't have to feel like you have to spend a ton of time on this. I feel like I found that it's okay to spend just even you know, three minutes on this. You don't have to get through an entire song. It's okay to figure out just the first part of the chorus of a song or the first part of the first verse. Once kids get good at a simple folk song, you can then try choosing their favorite songs from the radio. And they love trying to figure those out and just spend a few minutes on it and then just leave it at that. And some students will go home and they'll try to finish it at home and they can come back and see what they did and you can congratulate them. And uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's great. And I've got it printed out in front of me. And so it's a little four page uh, handout, which has just been beautifully created uh, for us. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, and so the first page is the instructions, a simple four-step formula. So choosing the song, giving the starting note and the range. Help, uh, step three is helping a student figure out the first three to five notes and then turning them loose. And then she's given the example on the next page of Mary Had a Little Lamb and there's a little keyboard uh, with the star on the starting note and you could highlight the range or something like that for the kid. Um, and then also the same for Frere Jaca, which is great. And then there's some additional comments as well you've got here too. Um, about practice, ear training, and student favorites. And as you say, it's okay to keep it brief. So nice little reminders there. Thank you very much for creating that. And if you're interested in downloading that, as I said, you can head to timtopham.com slash episode 108. Always good to have a freebie to, uh, to go along with an episode. Um, I was just thinking as you're talking then too, when it comes to uh, bigger groups, so let's say people are teaching groups of four kids or eight kids, have you got any or have you heard of any good ways or good kind of group games for oral training in slightly bigger groups? Or perhaps you don't because that's not the group size that you teach, I'm not sure. Do you mean like different from the ones that, that I've shown you? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if there's any kind of interactive um, activities that, uh, that a larger group can uh, get involved in. Um, like I've played these games with up to... My biggest group size right now is eight. And so it works really good in a group size. You just give each kid their own copy. And what I like to do is I actually put them in page protectors and give them a dry erase marker and then I'm not printing things over. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, And uh, yeah. And so we just do them together and then check everyone's answers and and they have a lot of fun in the group. It's a bit like bingo (laughs) for some of them. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, well, look, thank you very much for sharing all that. Um, and I know that as well as putting a focus on oral training, you do a lot of improvising uh, in your lessons. So do you feel there's a link between ear training and a student's ability to create at the piano? And you mentioned it at the start a little bit. W- what is that link and, and how do you feel it's strengthened by oral work? Yeah, I I just really feel like um, doing the ear training helps the kids, like I said, be able to take what they're hearing in their head and reproduce it and also pay more attention. And um, I've noticed a big difference with my students who have been doing ear training versus a student who transfers in that the kids who have had the ear training, they create such better music. I don't know how else to describe it, but they they're listening to what they're creating. They'll have some, I can see sometimes that they've got something that they're trying a sound that they want to try to create and they sit there and, and they'll try things and they'll try it until they get it. And uh, it's it's really neat to see them using their ears and then really being creative and having fun and making music. Mm. I do a lot of chord progression work with my students, as you probably know. And I, when a student's playing something and they they're not sure of the next step, I'll 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 hear something in my head. I'll hear where this chord progression should go next. And I'll say, can you can you hear? Can, do you do you want it to go somewhere? Can you hear where it should go? And sometimes they'll say, no, really don't have an idea. But as I work more and more on this with students and getting them listening, they'll say, yes, I do. And I'll noodle around until they find the note that they're hearing in yeah. their head. And that's when you yes. know that you've made this connection. Yes. It's, it's a, a really great thing for students to be able to, to, to get. And as you say, some students will naturally get it faster. Um, others need a little bit more work on it. But I think the thing to take away from today is just start 
simple, start regularly, just do a little bit every now and then. Uh, it's just a- anything we can do to improve our listening skills and our students' listening skills would be great. Now, I was doing a little bit of research on you and uh, I understand that at your recitals, your students, all your students play something they've learned and something they've created, which I totally love. I think this is so, so cool. So do you, do you actually push all your students to do this? And if so, how do you encourage those kids who don't really want to do it? Because not every kid wants to, I find. Yeah. So kind of some of the background is I decided that I really wanted to elevate students' compositions. Um, before, I um, used to kind of think that the songs they created, they they weren't real music, right? It was just them noodling around or whatever. And um, But then their compositions and their improvisations started getting really good and I wanted to share them. Uh, but I couldn't do that at a recital, right? Because it wasn't real music. But um, then I just finally decided, you know, why not? You know, and why am I sending this message to students that the songs they create aren't as important as the music that's created by others? And in fact, in their lives, I think that the music they create probably will be more important to them. They're going to have more fun with it. It's going to be more meaningful to them. So I decided to elevate it and we're going to start at recitals. The kids get to showcase what they're creating. So if someone really, really, really doesn't want to do it, I don't absolutely force them, but I, I do push pretty hard. Um, and I feel like it's worth it. I do. So what I do is I just tell everyone at this recital, you're going to be playing one song that you learned and one song that you created. And it's as easiest for students who have started at the beginning doing this. So like young students, so even my little like six-year-old students who are just beginners, they get up there at the recital and they play some really simple little thing they created. And it's not like amazing or anything, but they are so proud of themselves and their parents love it too. And so it's, it's worth it. Um, and then they're used to that. And then every year their songs get better and more impressive. And then before you know it, we have these amazing songs <laughs> performed at the recitals because students actually can play, they can create something much more complex than what they can read. And so if you let students do that, you're going to have much more amazing music at your recitals. Mm. It's really cool. Um, so then, but if you have kids who haven't been doing this since they were six years old, um, you got to prime them for it. And so you think, why would a student be hesitant to do this? And the reason is because they're afraid they're going to go up there and sound stupid, right? They're, they're nervous. They're afraid they're going to flop. And so throughout the year, we just do lots and lots of creative activities. And every time I'm just praising them, like, wow, that was awesome what you created. I love how that sounds. You are so good at this. They need to feel like they're good at it. And we do improv duets at the beginning. So they're improvising like on the black keys. I mean, you're going to sound great if you're doing a black key improv. And um, I like to have the parents come in at the end of the lesson when we're doing that. And the parent is oftentimes like, wow, what did you just do during that black key improv duet? They don't know what it's called, but they are just amazed by what their student just created. And then the parent praises the student. I've even had times where the mom comes to pick up the student, hears the student improvising, was so blown away. The next day, dad comes, next week, dad comes <laughs> to pick up the student because he wants to hear it. Um, and so the student's getting this positive feedback and it's building their confidence that they can create music at the piano that is impressive, that people like to hear and that they're good at it. So if you're doing that year round, uh, all year long, that's really going to help. And um, if I still have students who are a little nervous, I'll do their creative performance the recital can be an improv duet with me. So I've gone up there with a student and done a black key improv duet with them. And it sounds great. And the student has a lot of fun and they don't feel as nervous because the teacher's there with them. and It's not focused on them, but I feel like it's worth it to push the kids. They, after they perform their compositions, they are so proud of themselves. And usually those are the, comp- those are the performances that, audience goes the craziest over they love those performances Mm. yeah i was going to ask if you play along sometimes with kids because yes you're right that just takes it's more fun often for particularly the beginners who aren't making a big sound you can fill it out Uh, but it also yeah provides that support so i really love what you're doing it's it's something i would encourage any teacher to do because it does it there's no reason why we shouldn't be elevating the creative aspect of music making at least equally to reading, if not higher than reading. I mean, the the kids doing this actually are more skilled, more well-rounded musicians, in my opinion, than those who can only read. And that's why I'm so big on the whole creative aspect of teaching. Do you get students to write down their compositions? 
Um, sometimes I do. Most of the time, I don't stress about it. I just let them create something and play it. But sometimes we do do some that they write down. Mm. Um, usually for them, it's more fun though if they can just go jam. Although I do have some students occasionally that won't do anything unless they write it down. All right. So yeah. They take up their little sheet that they that they've written on. But yeah, most of them don't. And what's your process uh, uh, as a quick overview from from turning an improv into a composition? I don't know. We just we just do lots of creative activities throughout the year. And then when it comes time for recital time, okay, so when it comes time for recital time, they're getting ready for their big composition that they're going to perform that they created themselves. I usually give them a little handout for their, their spring composition guidelines. And so I'll say, hey, we've tried all these things throughout the year, and I'd like you to take these elements that we've learned and maybe, you know, use ABA musical form or something along those lines. Uh, but I give them some guidelines so it's not so overwhelming. And then I say, go home, start working on this. And the next week you'll come back, and you'll play it for me and I'll give you some tips and we can kind of keep tweaking it and go home the next week, work on it some more. And just every week we work on it up until we get to the recital. And by the recital, they have a piece that sounds pretty impressive and that they're really proud of. I like that. Yeah, that, that, that idea of the guidelines around a composition. You don't by any chance have an example of those guidelines, do you? Oh, I, let's see. On your website? I don't have one on my website. I have stuff that I've handed out to my students, so I maybe need to make those available. I just do things like, I want your to include two arpeggios, or I want it to be created around this theme. Like right now we're doing Halloween, and so students are making up little stories around Halloween themed things and then composing songs that match what happens with the storyline. Yeah. Um, I'm just yeah, I'm friend, thinking like, that uh, teachers listening would be like, oh, I would love to see that check. I would uh, personally, I, I think it's great. And the reason I ask the question is because I, I get to this kind of point in the year, I've been doing crazy amounts of improvising with students, chord progressions, melodies, whatever it is. When it comes to creating those end of year compositions, it becomes quite difficult unless you do structure it quite clearly. So um, if you happen to find it, we can we can pop a link in the show notes. Um, so just let oh, me know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no worries. Well, look, thank you so much, uh, Kristen, for giving us these great little tips and tricks, not only on the oral but also on the improvising. Uh, and as I said, if you're, uh, you know, at all inspired by what Kristen's doing with this whole idea of play something that you've learned, play something that you've created at the end of your recitals, um, then give it a shot. As, it, as uh, Kristen says, it doesn't matter how simple it is. It, uh, it's the meaning behind it and the way that it's being elevated, as you say, to the equal status, I think is so important. And there is so much information online now about improvising and helping students do that. So there's no excuses for anyone. And you've got lots on your website too. So you can find out more about Kristen and all the great things that she's been doing for teachers at myfunpianostudio.com. Thank you so much, Kristen. Absolute pleasure hanging out with you today. And I uh, look forward to speaking with you live sometime at a conference or something, perhaps. For sure. Thanks a lot, Tim. All right. So don't forget your freebie download for today. And the links are all available at timtopham.com slash episode 108. And a thanks to everyone who has left reviews on Facebook and iTunes. I really do appreciate the feedback. You can find out how you too can support the work that I'm doing on these podcasts if you're enjoying them by leaving a review. The instructions are at timtopham.com slash review. Next week, we're getting another angle on playing by ear, as I mentioned, from Christopher Sutton, who runs a website called musicalu.com. We'll be talking about improving your oral skills as a teacher, and particularly with regard to sulfur or solfege. Um, if you've ever wondered what that is and what all this do, re, me and movable do talk is all about, then that is going to be the episode for you. We're going to dive into that and also talk generally about how you can improve your own oral. And we'll even be running a couple of live tests on air so you can test your own skills and see where you're at. Until then, uh, happy teaching and I'll speak to you then. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.